Hi, and welcome to the next installment of our VHDL design series. Uh, one of the things that we're going to talk about today is hardware. So we're going to be diving into uh, CPLD architecture. So we're going to, we should probably start by talking about um, the two main types of hardware that you're going to find in the programmable logic industry today, and that is CPLDs and FPGAs. Uh, CPLDs and FPGAs have been around for quite a while and they've each had a fairly niche market where they've um, kind of dominated. You'll find that CPLDs have tended to go into the low power industry, uh, things that are low cost, um, that don't need an, a massive amounts of logic, uh, will tend to be in the CPLD range and then the FPGA range will tend to be with high powered, you know, complex devices and such. As the industry advances and changes, uh, this is changing slightly as we see uh, more CPLDs, um, sorry, more FPGAs having uh, a wider diversity of, uh, of options with them, including things like um, uh, flash-based uh, versus SRAM-based configuration for the FPGAs, et cetera, et cetera, or, or kind of blurring the lines between the two devices, but they still maintain a, a relatively uh, unique market that you're gonna be targeting for each one. So we're gonna talk about the CPLD today and the CPLD and how it's structured internally and how we use the CPLD in designs. Now, this is really one of those things that we're kind of opening the hood, if you will, of the hardware, seeing how it functions on the inside. And while writing VHDL code doesn't necessarily mean you have to know exactly how it works inside, uh, knowing how it works can really help you become a better designer. Now, I'll start by saying VHDL should not be programmed to target a specific type of hardware. That's generally bad practice. You want to create generic VHDL designs that are vendor, ind vendor independent, which means you can use anybody's chip in your design uh, that you need based on what the, what the best chip is for your system. Uh, but understanding how things work on the inside could actually make you a better designer. So I think it's I think it's an important thing to dive into. So let's get started and talk a little bit about the uh, advantages of using or the characteristics of using a CPLD in our designs. And the first thing that you'll notice is that generally CPLDs will have a, a lower gate density. They'll tend to not be uh, for large scale systems. They're really for uh, logic that is a little less complicated or, or a little less um, resource hungry. Uh, and, and they tend to also, uh, because of that, the uh, generally lower pin counts. Now, we, we talk in terms of general, but remember generalities, um, there's always gray zones because the industry keeps coming out with different types of chips and different you know characteristics. So you can get a wide range of pin outputs for CPLDs and a wide range of gate densities, depending on how much you want to pay. But in general, uh, you're going to find that uh, CPLDs are going to have a pretty significant price reduction over FPGAs. Uh, they tend to be you know, a lot cheaper, and that can really help keep your uh, cost down if your design doesn't really need a lot of complexity. Um, they also generally consume less power uh, for a variety of reasons, but uh, and again, this is a generality. There are still going to be a variety of FPGAs that actually produce or, or, or use a low power as well as the market keeps growing and changing. But in general, uh, CPLDs will give you a little less power consumption. And CPLDs, by their architecture, by the way they're structured and constructed, uh, will tend to favor combinational logic over register-based logic. Okay, So there's a lot more resources for doing combinational logic in a CPLD then there are um, uh, flip-flops or, or register resources. And that can affect your design as well. So if you have a register intensive design, then, then CPLD may not be uh, for you, uh, but you can, you know, it really needs to be tailored to what it is you're trying to, to get at. Typically when I'm using CPLDs in a design, I look at a number of characteristics, uh, the cost, the size of the design, and the performance I'm looking for. Um, you know, and, and a lot of those things are going to be weighed against one another before you decide which device you want to use. And that's why I say you don't really target 
a particular piece of hardware in your VHDL code because you, you don't want to limit yourself. Um, if you can fit your design in a CPLD and the, um, <clears throat> the CPLD will meet all the needs of your, your functional uh, behavioral um, requirements, then you want to go with a CPLD because it'll be cheaper, you know, lower cost in the, in the end, and, and your device will still function exactly as you intended it. Now, one of the huge advantages of CPLDs, at least early on, was the use of non-volatile configuration storage. So when you program a CPLD with your design, with your configuration, uh, it will hold the design for a long period of time. Most, most are guaranteed for 10 plus years uh, to hold the design that you program into them. Uh, you would have to check with the specific manufacturer to find out what, what their duration is, but it tends to be uh, significantly longer than most product cycles. So it's, it's, a, it's a fairly safe bet when you to program it and then you're good to go. Um, when you program a CPLD, you're really loading stuff into um, um, non-volatile storage elements that when the power goes away and then you return power, it will still be where you left it. Okay, so it will still be programmed the way you'd left it. And so there is no real boot up time required. When it turns on, it tends to come on fairly quickly and, and start running fairly quickly at, at the onset. Not, not necessarily the case with a lot of FPGAs. And we'll talk more about that in our next video. So that's an overview of the CPLD. Let's take a look at how it works on the inside. So what, what is it made of? What makes a CPLD different uh, from an FPGA? And the interesting thing about CPLDs is they're really an evolutionary step from the early uh, programmable logic devices that we saw in the market years ago. Uh, generally, programmable logic started off with small chips. Um, uh, I think the, the one I used the most was the GAL uh, 22V10, which is a small um, IC that basically allowed you a small amount of logic, I think. Uh, it had 10 uh, macro cells in it for 10 flip-flops and uh, allowed for uh, 22 inputs um, in the design. That's why it's called 22V10. Uh, but you, but it, the configuration depended on, or how you used it depended on what you were trying to do. These were uh, small devices and the as they needed more and more logic, they started making bigger chips. And, and the CPLD basically was a representation of these small devices multiplied within the design. So a lot of earlier designs would actually call out, uh, you know, their density was how many equivalent GAL 22B10s they had in them. So, so that was the earlier way that they, they talked about this. And in fact, they were almost basically duplicating the functionality in multiple places in the, in the silicon. So let's take a look at what, what, how they did things. Now, obviously storage was done with flip-flops and that tended to be in D flip-flops because those are a universal standard for storage. And then uh, combinational logic was done in something called a programmable logic array. So this is what a programmable logic array actually looks like. Um, it's an interesting configuration where you have this very large grid of interconnected lines and that grid drives a, um, an, an array of AND gates, and those are all fed into an OR gate. Now, all of this is fundamentally done because all combinational logic, as we know from digital, uh, can be described in a sum of products. So you can create any, any combinational logic can be reduced down to a sum of products expression, and therefore we can implement that in hardware. For instance, if I have, and let's just throw on an example here. Let's say that we have inputs A, B, C, and D here. And those are the inputs to our, our logic. And we want to create an expression for an output X. And we can say, well, let's see, that'd be A, B bar, or C, D bar. Okay, so this could be a sum of products expression. Each one of the elements in the expression or the products is actually representative of an individual gate in this array of gates. So you would handle each one of these elements in each one of the AND gates, and then that would be fed into an OR gate. And remember the OR gate itself 
really represents the OR function there. So you're basically taking you're basically taking that term and that term and ORing them together. So, so this is kind of how it all works. It's fairly simple, really, if you think about it. The most complex part of it is going to be uh, this area over here where we combine the signals from the inputs with the inputs to the AND gate or the product terms. So let's take a real close look at that. And we'll back up a bit and we'll take a closer look at that. So if we come in and we look a little bit closer here, we'll notice that there are an equal number of inputs. Oops, sorry about that. There are an equal number of inputs here for the, for the product terms uh, as there are inputs for the system. So every input that comes in goes through a buffer and it is a non-inverted element versus an inverted element. In other words, so, so when we come through here, if D is coming through here, this wire right here represents D and this represents a D bar. Okay, and so now these are fed into this grid or uh, in which we can make or break connections. So if we want to implement this function, A, B bar, and C, D bar, well, this output here would be A, B bar, and this output here could be C, D bar. And so we would want to make sure, well, if this is A, that's A bar, this is B and that's B bar and this is C and that's C bar. So I would want to connect A, right? And I would want to connect B bar to this AND gate. All the others are going to be unconnected, which will be ignored by the logic and basically only take the things that are connected to it and pass that through. Down here, the C and D bar would connect C and then we would connect D bar as another input here, and that would create those. So, so the idea is you make these connections inside um, the device, and these connections will stay there and make sure that this is always configured in this way. Now, the connectivity or the way you connect things is more complex, um, and we're going to look at that in just a second. But I do want to uh, review these the the, the basic. Uh, concepts here. So the basic concepts is you have an input, a series of inputs feeding into the grid. You are providing both the inverted and non-inverted version of those inputs in the grid. Every product term has access to the inputs by simply making the connections that you want to make. And so these are all fed into an OR gate to give you your final answer. And it's all centered around the fact that you can describe any combinational logic as a sum of products. Okay, so you never thought you'd use that old digital stuff again, right? But here it is popping right up again. So basically the sum of products helps us to find the logic to do this. Now there's lots of different ways to approach this. Uh, you may remember product of sums is another way of expressing. And so you can have an array of OR gates uh, feeding into an AND gate, which gets you the... Um, uh, uh, the sum of product, the product of sums. So all of these things are, are possible, but this is the most common configuration for the CPLD. Now these can be very big and they can be, they can fill up a lot of space. So they do take up space in the CPLD um, uh, as far as generating the logic, but they are incredibly well suited for complex combinational logic, especially when you put feedback paths into the grid and it allows uh, some pretty complex connections. And, and some of the CPLDs do provide you know, some nice, uh, nice things there. And one of the biggest problems with CPLDs internally is routing. Uh, when you have this complexity, routing from one part of the chip to the other part of the chip can be a real uh, complexity there. And so that does limit some of the connectivity because of that. So if you want to keep your chip size small, uh, you, you may have to limit some of the, the complexity in there. So you are somewhat limited in how many product terms you can use. Um, and, and it depends on how many macro cells you have. And we're going to talk about what that looks like in a second. All right. So that's basically how combinational logic is done. So let's say, how, let's see kind of how we make those connections and, and see another example. You'll notice that when we drew this system, we're showing these line crossings here, right? So the dots represent where we're making 
connections. All these dots here are all about making connections inside the grid. And that's typically done with an element here that basically connects or disconnects the two lines together. Now you can use uh, lots of different technologies for this. Um, floating gate technology is a, is a popular one where you can uh, uh, dump charge onto a gate of, of, a, uh, of a MOSFET transistor. And then if you isolate the gate, it's called a floating gate, that charge will stay there and won't bleed out um, for years. Okay. So you basically turn it on by loading, uh, flooding it, sorry, loading up a charge into the gate and then, uh, you, uh, deplete the charge in order to make it turn off. So this is a way you can make or break connections inside, um, a, a CPLD. What's really interesting is in the early days and early programmable devices, they used to use fusible links. Uh, which meant that they were literally fuses between the two wires. And so to program the device, you would over, you would uh, drive a high current through there with a high voltage, and it would basically blow the fuse and make a disconnect. So the device, the, the Virgin device, the one that hadn't been programmed yet, would have all the connections made. And then to program it, you would blow the fuses. And that would break the connections, right? So see, think of it as an anti-fuse pattern. So what's interesting is when you look at uh, terminology and, and programmable logic, you'll sometimes see things as referred to as like a fuse map and that kind of stuff. And that's all kind of arcing back to the old days when they used to use um, fuses to do this. Fuses were very problematic in the sense that they would sometimes leave traces along the edge when they were blown. And so they weren't completely blown. So you'd have some conducting current and that could lead to some issues where the chip wasn't functioning properly. But the fusible ones are actually quite popular for, um, you know, the space program and stuff like that because, you know, once they're blown, they're blown. And if you run a thorough test, you can make sure that the blow, you know, that they were blown properly. And the connections, you don't have to worry about going away. They're, they're going to be there for, for long, long, long periods of time. And so that leads to some real nice stability. Uh, if you're using instead some sort of a, a charge, like a floating gate technology for doing that, then there are chances over time that it could bleed out or could be affected by interesting external radiation patterns that might be there in space, but not necessarily in Earth. So that's just a, you know, we took a little side trip there, but <laughs> that does hopefully help you understand how these things are done and, and put together. So if we look at this, we're going to look at an example, and that is of this equation where we have um, a, uh, a and B bar ORD with B and um, C bar D. And so basically, this is just a simple Boolean logic expression that we're going to use our CPLD uh, programmable logic array to create the logic for. Uh, she'll notice that we have all these inputs are provided here. So to make this work, we're making a connection between A input and the input to this um, uh, AND gate, as well as the B bar input to the AND gate. So let's draw on here so we can see this better. So we've got A coming in. So A feeds in here and then A goes to, whoops, there we go. And so then A goes down to this first line and feeds into that AND gate. So that's how the connection works. And then we've got B coming through and going through the inverter and feeding to the next one. So this leads to, you know, right here, this would be A and B bar. And that's why this term appears out here. And to make the connection over here on the second AND gate, uh, we have the term, let's see, what is it? B, uh, C bar, oh boy, that's drawn wrong. B, C bar, D. So let's, we gotta, we're gonna have to fix that. Uh, but B would come down here and the connection should be here. So that's B would go there. And then C bar would feed here. And then of course we've got D uh, coming down here and then that creates as we said before 
the uh, C, the A, C bar D term. And then we run that through the OR gate and therefore we create the final equation on the output. So this is wrong, so sorry about that. That was an error in my slide. Uh, that should be over here, right there, uh, and represent a connection between B uh, and the uh, input to that gate. So you see how simple this is? Is If you take any expression you come up with and you can reduce it down to a sum of products, then you're gonna be great. So you're gonna be able to, to tie this together and create a nice combinational logic output. All right, so let's take a look at some shorthand notation that you're gonna see in the data sheets for CPLDs that might be confusing for the first time. But you'll notice that now we've shrunk the AND gate down to a little bitty um, AND gate with one input and one output, which doesn't make an awful lot of sense for an AND gate. Uh, the reason we do that is to make it more presentable graphically in our, in our data sheets and other things. So you'll see this done a lot to make it clearer graphically that this is a multi-input AND gate, but it, it's an AND gate, but we don't want to draw all the AND gates. So look, we just had here uh, in this particular example we just had, um, what, one, two, three, seven or eight inputs. Well, technically it should be eight inputs, uh, but it doesn't have to be. It just depends on how many uh, elements you're gonna be in here. But in here, I think we've drawn one, two, three, four, five, six, okay. Six inputs on these. And so just imagine if you're trying to cover a lot of inputs, maybe 22 inputs, right? And so they're all inverted, so that's 44 inputs. And so this would become unwieldily difficult to draw. So we adopt a strategy for drawing where we use a single AND gate with a single input and an output to represent all the inputs along that grid. So in this particular case, there would be eight inputs there that are possible. All those inputs along that grid are, are gonna be, you can feed into your system, okay? So that, that's just a shorthand notation. Now, the other thing that I, I wanna do for the sake of our examples that are occur later is draw the hexadecimal representation of the binary representation of the connection map, okay? Or what we sometimes refer to as the fuse map. And so if we represent a connection with a one, we could represent the connection here as one, and that would be zero, zero, one, zero, 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 zero then we'll see that that number is right here, 1001, zero, zero, one, and then we can write that as a hex value as uh, 0x90. Zero zero. So let's do the same for the next value. This would be 1001010, zero, 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 one, one, zero, and that would be this value here, which represents 86 in, in hexadecimal. Remember, we always use the 0x at the beginning to represent a hexadecimal value. Um, in the digital area. So this is how we would program this with a value because this is actually what's going on when you write a configuration to your CPLD is you're actually turning on or off these connections with bits. You also They also affect other things like multiplexers and, and such and we'll see that in a second. But that's the gist of this. When you write VHDL code, you synthesize the code into a bit stream and then that bit stream feeds into the device, all those bits are doing is turning on and off connections on these grids and configuring multiplexers to point to different ways of how you want the design to be routed. So we're gonna do a couple of examples to kind of bring this home. Um, we'll start, uh, well, first off, we gotta talk about the macro cell. Then we're gonna do a couple of examples. So all of this, this uh, notation, this, this um, uh, programmable logic array stuff is for combinational logic, but we want to have registered logic as part of our design as well. And so to do that, the manufacturers create these things called macro cells. Now the macro cells have a array as part of them, like this one here, which has the AND terms going into the final OR term and feeding in. But we also have the addition of a D flip-flop for storage, because we, we know that in our digital system, we may want to and will likely uh, utilize some sort of a synchronous design where we have a synchronous sequential system and we want storage. And so for that, we would have to have our D flip-flop. And so this represents what's called a macro cell. Now this is not what every unit has. Every manufacturer has a 
completely different macro cell configuration, significantly more complex than this one. I drew this simple one here so that we could see how they function in general and kind of understand how they're programmed. But most macro cells have significantly more resources in the multiple multiplexers that feed into different things. Some have uh, multi flip flops in a single macro cell. It just depends on the manufacturer and what they're trying to achieve with their design. But in general, these are the elements that they'll have. They'll have some sort of multiplexer elements. They'll have some sort of storage elements like a D flip flop. And then they'll have some sort of programmable logic array to create your combinational logic. So if we're gonna do this um, and, and, and show you how this things work, let's go through the process of showing you how to program them for a specific um, a need, okay? So we're gonna start with a simple example uh, where we're gonna program the logic for that particular equation there. So this is just a random equation that I put out here that we can use as a guide to, to program our macro cell for this functionality. So the macro cell itself is going to be programmed to represent this Boolean expression. So to do that, we have to look at how the macro cell is configured, how the inputs are fed, and, and even how the feedback paths are occurring. So notice that we have in this particular configuration, we have three inputs, A, B, and C, and those are feeding into our, into our grid here in our programmable logic array. We also have a nice feedback path that feeds back into the array too, which will help us with designing things for uh, synchronous sequential systems like counters and other things where we need to know what the current state is of the output in order to decide what the next state is going to be. So these feedback paths are gonna be important to feed into our grid. Uh, the multiplexer is important because it allows us to determine how to route our signal. Uh, we can have a combinational signal go straight through to the output like this, we can have it go through an inverter to the output. We can feed the output of the flip-flop or we can feed the inverse output of the flip-flop to the output, depending on what value we put in our MUX over here. Pretty straightforward, right? And so zero, one, two, and three are the values the MUX can take on. This is hex values. And so we would decide what those values would be to, to determine which way this, this goes. So in this particular case, let's dive in and let's look at what we need to do to program this thing. So we're gonna have three product terms in here. And so one is A bar B. So obviously we're gonna to wanna to, to connect that one there. Okay, so that's A bar. And then we're gonna connect B. Now remember we use the shorthand notation where we only use a single line feeding into the AND gate, even though there are literally, in this particular case, eight lines feeding into that AND gate. Uh, by doing it this way, it makes it easier to draw um, and, and it's a shorthand notation. But remember, it still has all those inputs. So A and A bar B would be those two dots that are activated. And that would create the A bar B. So let's, let's kind of write that down actually. So this, this would be A bar B on that output. Right, and so we have A, B, and C bar. So let's do that one. So we've got, well, I've got to pull this down a little bit. So it's A, B, well, we're gonna to have to zoom out. So there it is. That's A, B, C bar. So it would be, for the next one, it's gonna be A, that's A, and then we've got B, and then we've got C bar, okay? Because remember, we're taking the inverse of C here. So C feeds through here and goes to the inverse. Then B is going here and then A is feeding here. So that's how we, that's how we decide to make those connections. So if we come in here now, uh, we'll see that this is going to be the A, B, C bar term. Okay, that's A, B, C bar. Now the next one is B bar C. So we're gonna jump in and do B bar C. Let's see, here's B bar, and then there's C, all right? And so this now becomes B bar C, okay? And so what's output here will be X on the output of this OR gate. This is how we program the system. So now what we have to do is, is, is decide the values that go into the 
uh, each product term. So right over here, I've got this little box where we can fill in the hex value. Now this hex value, and I'm gonna draw this in a, let's, let's use a different color that's a little more um, um, vibrant. How about some, some orange? And so what we'll do is we'll say, okay, this is one, zero, no, man, am I getting it backwards or what? Zero, one, one, zero, and then zero, 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 zero. So hexadecimal, if I'm drawing this in, as in hex, this is going to be zero x uh, six zero. Okay, so that's the hex value that's feeding in to that product term. Now, if we go down here, this is one zero one zero zero one zero zero. Remember, a one means you're making a connection, and a zero means you're not. And so this would end up being. Um, what is that? Uh, it's able. Yeah. So that's zero x a, and then the next one is four. So a four would be that one. And then for the last one here, we're going to have zero 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 one, and then one zero zero zero. So that's going to be hex um, one eight. And then, of course, this one's not connected to anything, so this will be just zero, zero. And so that's how you would program the product terms for that particular um, uh, equation, or sorry, uh, logic. And then the X would feed out here. Now, the key is we want X, which is our output, to feed out of our device. So we want to make sure that the path it follows would be something like this. We're not gonna invert it. And so we're gonna basically run through uh, at, at level three there. So if we're gonna program this, we would say zero X three, and this is hex three. Remember this is a, uh, you got four choices, zero, one, two, or three. So by setting this to three, we're selecting that pathway and doing that. So when you, when you design and synthesize something in VHDL, you're creating a bit stream and that bit stream is going in and writing bits into various places in the hardware in order to configure them as connections or not connections and then configure uh, multiplexers to route the signals in certain ways. And so that's pretty much how it all works on the inside. Uh, one last example, and we'll, 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 we'll finish out with that, is the implementation of a toggle flip-flop. So let's say that we want to configure this macro cell to use the D flip-flop and we want to use it as a toggle flip-flop. Now you'll notice that the D flip-flop already has the reset and clock connected and as we've talked about in our designs you'll want the clock connected to a universal system clock and then the reset connected to some sort of universal reset signal. And then that will, that will handle the initialization because you want to make sure that these elements are initialized. Now, sometimes they don't have to be initialized depending on what the logic is, but I like to err on the side of initializing everything uh, to make sure I've got a really rock solid design on my hands. So if we're doing a toggle flip-flop, that means we're going to have to use the feedback path of the, um, uh, 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 into the array here to feed back into D input on this side right there. So we're gonna have the output come back, feed through, and then go back in in order to, to invert that output. So the idea is to take that output, invert it, and then feed that in so that when the next clock cycle comes, it will send out the inver inverted version of that. And so that's fairly easy to draw on this one. So this is a relatively easy example because if, the, if we want the inverted path, we'll come off the inverter, We'll make the connection right here, uh, and then that will feed in here. Now, there's only one input in this case, but that's okay. Um, all the other inputs, you know, will be ignored that aren't connected. So this will be basically just a simple inverter, and that inverter will feed into the D input, and then out the Q will come here. We'll select that, and then that will out come here, and then again, this is our feedback path here that goes back into the system. So this would be our, our toggle flip-flop, if you will. So to program this, we would want to write in uh, the appropriate values, sticking with our same notation as before, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 1, because we have that single connection there. And so this would basically end up being a hex value of 0, 1. 
The rest of these are not connected, so they would be zero, zero. And then uh, over here, we would need to program the mux as a hex value of one because we're selecting the input one here to drive the output. So programming the bits in this way will result in a toggle flip-flop that is initialized with a uh, system reset and clocked with the system clock. And so there you have it. So this is, this is an example of a um, sequential design uh, element in the, in the um, macro cell. And this is an example of a combinational element in the macro cell. And like we've said before, all CPLDs uh, have a macro cell defined by their manufacturer. It will have a lot of different features, but normally you don't have to worry about that. Uh, when you use a synthesis tool from the manufacturer, they know their hardware and how it's configured, so they know how to translate your design specification into their particular hardware. But I think it's valuable understanding how these things work inside so that you understand the resources that are available to you. Typically, you don't want to tailor your design to your hardware, but in the case of trying to you know, cut the cost down or fit a design in a, in a, in a tight architecture, or, you know, in a small um, footprint, you, you can take advantage of this by creating code that does tailor itself to a particular chip or a particular methodology. So, for instance, in FPGAs, since they're more register intensive, you might create a design that has far more register elements to it um, in order to get the design in, in, in more space inside your, in your, inside your design. So CPLDs, really a great resource, low cost, um, non-volatile storage, which means when they power up, they're ready to go. So there's a lot of advantages here uh, and, and, and it can be very useful. The next video, we're gonna be diving into FPGAs and how FPGAs work and we'll learn, learn a little bit more about those as, as well and, and maybe help, help you decide which ones you're gonna target for whatever design you're using. All right, so that's it for the video today. Thanks a lot for coming and we'll see you guys in the next video.